today talking with Charlie Croto, who has been involved with the independent living movement for 15 years, who has been a fair hearing officer for the state of Massachusetts rehab. Um, Charlie lectures at most of the colleges in the Boston area on spinal cord injury and wheelchair mobility and has authored a book on wheelchair mobility. Today we're going to talk with Charlie about how he has become independent after his spinal cord injury. Charlie, can we begin by um, asking some questions about what happened to you um, to cause your spinal cord injury and when did the injury occur? Sure, we can cover anything you want to cover. Okay. So what happened? How did you become injured? Well, I broke my neck uh, when I was 20 years old on a trampoline doing back somersaults and I was a student at the University of Montana State University, I should say. Um, well, I broke my neck and basically they scooped me up on a special stretcher and brought me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that acute phase of your injury when you were in the hospital in Montana and what happened in the days and weeks following the injury? Okay, well, initially, I think most patients don't know what to think. I never realized that you could become paralyzed from mm -hmm. breaking your neck. I, you know, I always thought, well, you break your neck, you're dead type of, of a thing, which really is not true. Uh, but I never knew about uh, the medical or rehabilitation phases of, of spinal cord injury, nor did I know anything about spinal cord injury. Um, so when I first got hurt, everything was, was very new and you're kind of wondering how do you act, what's, the, what's happening. It seems like everything is going wrong all at once. Uh, for example, I didn't have any medical insurance for off-campus medical care. And then when I got to the hospital, the doctors were like, well, we have to call your parents. And I was like, well, why don't you just, you know, fix my neck and... Uh, Send me home. And I'll, I'll go home and tell them, oh, yeah, by the way, I broke my neck and stuff. And they're like, no, you don't understand. This is, this is very serious, and we have to call your parents, and maybe they'll come out here to Montana. My folks lived in Massachusetts. And um, so now not only did you hurt yourself, but now you're hurting your parents. And there's a, just a lot of physical pain as people saying, well, you may not walk again. And you're like, well, I'll get out of this no matter what. Uh, and then there's the, the psychological games. I mean, when I was growing up, the nuns that I had in Catholic school were always saying, you know, you're going to burn, God's going to punish you. And uh, so you're laying there on a striker frame wondering why is God punishing me for this. And um, so there's an awful lot of turmoil going on in your head. And you're trying to be calm and collected, especially in front of your parents. Mm -hmm. You don't want to show that you're worried or afraid or that something's hurting you because that just makes it worse for them. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a strange time. Sounds like a very scary time, too, in it, not knowing what was going to happen to you. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to be macho and say I wasn't scared, or, but really you're, you're like, wow, what am I going to do with myself? I can't even move. Mm -hmm. And what if, you know, how are you going to feed yourself? How, everything, right. it's just like, oh, right. it's crazy. Um, you talked a little bit about your emotional state and uh, how difficult it was to have your parents come in and, and be kind of like a, a burden on them all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, right after your injury, did you ever think about suicide? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think everybody who's normal, and I've been teaching for, well, 21 years on the spinal cord injury unit mm -hmm. in Boston. And you know, if most people are honest, they think about that. And you say, well, you shoot a hoss for breaking a leg. Why wouldn't you finish me off for breaking a neck? Um, and it, when you're there, it sounds pretty practical. So, I mean, for myself, uh, I had two brushes with it. Once was like probably three days after I got hurt. I was still extremely immobilized. My neck was still out of joint. Uh, and on the third night after I got hurt, I lost my eyesight. Mm. I was just lying on the on the striker frame, and I was like, what the heck is this? I'm, now I'm going to be blind and paralyzed. And so I just said, that's enough, God. I've had enough. I don't even want to play the game. I don't care if you, <laughs> I don't care what you want or what you're thinking or, you know, I've been a good boy for the last two or three days just praying my brains out here and 
now I'm losing my eyesight. And uh, so while I was laying there, I came up with this brilliant idea that if I cursed God, maybe he'd kill me. And I couldn't move. All I could move was my left shoulder at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, forget it. I don't want to be blind in. You know, I'm not going to go through that way. So uh, I cursed him out and thought he would kill me. And as soon as I got done doing that, I got my eyesight back. So it was a very <laughs> that was strange lesson. thing. I don't know what that means. You, but that's the type of weird stuff that's mm -hmm. going on. I think you're going without sleep. You're, I went days and days without sleep. I'm probably just about a whole month without really sleeping, mm. and that was weird in itself. But I think the other end of suicide is you're very angry with yourself if you've hurt yourself. As in my case, nobody else was really responsible for my accident. I just made a mistake. And you're like, how could you be so stupid mm -hmm. to get into this? And you begin to see how much it's costing and everything else. And you say to yourself, well, it would be simpler if I were dead. Mm -hmm. That would end the expenses right there uh, instead of dragging this out for a lifetime or however long. And uh, so I did consider suicide uh, as an option. Mm -hmm. And I, it is an option, I mean, but it's, yeah. uh, I would say to most people, you don't quite know the game yet, so. So probably it's one of the first things that people go through emotionally is thinking about maybe just ending it all, and uh, that'll be that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think any realistic and honest mm -hmm. person would say that they've considered suicide as, a, as an alternative. Once you were um, stabilized, were you moved then from Montana back home to Massachusetts? Yeah, fortunately for me, the Vietnam War was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, this was 27 years ago. Right. And uh, so I was able to get a flight on one of the uh, Air Force hospital jets that was oh. coming back from Vietnam. So that's how I got back from Montana to Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. it was fortunate for me that they had such a thing at that time because today the cost of uh, doing it would be astronomical. Mm, absolutely. Um, once you got back to Massachusetts, did you go then to a rehab facility? And can you talk a little bit about um, the rehab phase of your treatment yeah. and recovery? Unfortunately for me, I didn't go to a, I went to a nursing home mm -hmm. five weeks post-injury. And I had been uh, about four or five weeks without sleeping. And uh, after a certain amount of time, sleep deprivation, psychosis sets in. So I was pretty crazy by then. I mean, everything, everything meant something. Like three was the kingdom of God, or three was the key to the kingdom of God. And everybody's name had letters. Like my name begins Charles with three, so C was three. and. You divide the total of your name by three, and it was just weird. Mm. Uh, strange, strange time to be going through. But I went to a nursing home where I lasted for two days before they shipped me out, and <laughs> it was just, it was absolutely wild. I mean, I can remember my roommates didn't want me in the same room, so they dragged me out into the nurse's foyer. Yeah. And I can remember yelling up and down the hall, hey, everybody, turn on your lights or I won't shut up. And I could see up and down all the four corridors of this room. And, and eventually, everybody's light was on in the entire floor. And the nurse was behind the, at her desk crying away. And I was like, are you having a baby? If you're having a baby, you have to breathe this way. And I was totally out of it. Totally out of it. So yeah. from there? From there, they sent me to uh, City Hospital in uh -huh. Worcester, which was. Another big mistake. <laughs> oh, that was, that was the pits. That was my tour of hell. Mm -hmm. That was really tough sliding. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't like that place at all, and the care was, was absolutely horrendous. I had gotten great care in Montana, and then coming to, to Worcester, I was still on a striker frame, which is, you know, it's just a straight, flat pad, right. and they turn it every two hours. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't, I'd say, boy, my back is burning. Can you turn me over? And they would, just take it easy, Mr. Crotto. The next shift is coming on in 15 minutes, and they'll get you. And I was going hours on hours on end without. So uh, they weren't following through at the hospital. Not at all, and I never. What you needed. Really saw my doctor mm -hmm. there, and it was just. It was really terrible, and then they started giving me drugs because they thought I was a drug addict. Oh. 
uh, which wasn't the case at all. And yeah. so they started yeah. giving me Demerol, and that really made things crazy. Then I was hallucinating mm -hmm. uh, big time, and that was really wild. Yeah, and uh, eventually I had one of my brothers stop them from giving me uh, some drugs. I remember my oldest brother said, Joe, they're giving me drugs, and it's making me crazy. And he uh, just asked the nurse not to give me the drugs after she and I had had a little confrontation. She said she wasn't going to do it anyways. And <laughs> so uh, the next time I woke up, then my mind was clear, and I was yeah. pretty much as normal as I am now, uh -huh. <laughs> which, is, which is questionable. So there, then from there, you um, went to a rehab facility in Boston? Yes, yes. Fortunately there, I got uh, transferred against the doctor's orders in Worcester and went to uh, Boston University mm -hmm. Spinal Cord Injury Unit, which was... Where you should have been to begin with. Uh, yeah. It saved my life. It really yeah. was day and night. It was, mm -hmm. I got wonderful care there, and it really made a world of difference. So th that's when you really entered the rehab phase, when you finally were at a, a facility that was capable of working with you in your particular injury. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was really the true rehab phase, mm -hmm. which was about two months after I got gotten hurt. I spent five weeks in Montana and three in Worcester, and in Worcester I got a huge uh, decubitus ulcer, mm -hmm. and so I went to Boston. It took six weeks to. Just for that to heal. To clean that up and get that surgically repaired. And, mm -hmm. and then after that, you were able to begin OT and PT. And Even during that six-week phase, I was getting OT and PT. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting a lot of leg stretching, that type of stuff, passive range of motion. I was getting uh, eating skills mm. and things like that from OT. So it made it just a trend. Being able to feed yourself was a tremendous... Yeah. Was that one of the most important things for you to, to be able to learn how to do after your injury was to feed yourself? Or what were, maybe I can ask you, what were the most important things for you to, to be able to learn to be independent in? Well, I think the, the big three were uh, eating, dressing, mm -hmm. yep. and then, uh, I don't know, you'd have like bowel care mm -hmm. and catheterization, yeah. all that stuff is, is major. Um, but that was a bit beyond me when I was in rehab. And I think wheelchair mobility, just being mm -hmm. able to get around physically yeah. is a major uh, thing to try to overcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long were you um, at Boston University Hospital? I was there almost four months. Four months. Yeah, which is unprecedented. Yes. Today, it the is. average stay for yeah. a patient is about 60 yeah. days. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit shorter for paraplegic and maybe a little bit longer for quadriplegic. Right. Right. And that's from start to finish. Yeah. It certainly has changed a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the things that your OT and PTs taught you that you found to be really helpful or invaluable in being independent and kind of getting your life back together? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's not so much the as far as working with the OTs and PTs, I think it was not so much what they taught me, because a lot of it you end up having to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was the way they interacted with me. I had a wonderful therapist who uh, right away was not afraid to come up and put her hand on my shoulder and say, hi, Charlie, I'm Shelly, and mm -hmm. I'm going to work with you, and we're going to do this. And the fact that she was she's probably just a, a couple years older than myself, and the fact that she wasn't afraid to touch me and right. and look me square in the eye and say, hey, we're going to go do this, then I was like, great, I'd be happy to work with you. Because I think a lot of, um, during this time, a lot of the psychological things that are going on is who would ever date me again or who would ever, you know, how are you going to get out, get a date, yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. And, you know, some of your friends would come in there and be like, oh. you'd see them just, right. their color right. drain out of their face when they would see you. and they would, right. You're like, wow, I must really be ugly. And so to have somebody that was young and attractive and wasn't afraid of you, you were like, well, cool, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll do anything she wants. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it was more the, the um, relationship that evolved between you and your therapist that helped you to, to overcome parts of your injury and feel like you wanted to become more independent. Definitely. Yeah. And I think the 
I mean, you're getting dressed. It's an embarrassing mm -hmm. thing in a way. It's like, well, okay, let's forget the embarrassment. Let's right. work on getting dressed. Let's right. work on doing this. And it's a frustrating mm -hmm. time, but you can still have fun, laugh about it. Mm -hmm. When things are going to go wrong, you can just yeah. laugh about it instead of being just getting frustrated and crying about right. it. So uh, their attitude makes a big, big difference. If they're upbeat and able to goof around, it makes mm -hmm. life much better for yourself also. Okay. You talked a little bit about um, it, after the injury feeling like, well, who, who's going to want to go out with me, date me, uh, your mm -hmm. relationships with friends and that. Can you give us a little bit more about um, dating, working, um, your sexuality and that kind of thing um, that might be helpful to people watching the video? Sure. I mean, I think, um, I think dating is much easier for men than it is for women. First of all, I think women are much more accepting of a man's disability or, or something than men are of women. Men kind of like, they fall in love instantly. They like, oh, I'm in love. <laughs> and they'll do anything for that person. Yeah. Uh, whereas women kind of take their time and say, oh, well, he's a nice guy and you know, maybe this could work out. So I think mm -hmm. um, I'm fortunate to be a man in that situation. Mm -hmm. Not that there aren't women in, with spinal cord injuries right. that do date, get married, have children. Mm -hmm. right. uh, they do all of that. As far as the, uh, just from an anatomical or the anatomy part of sexuality, I think uh, most of the quadriplegics are fairly good as far as being able to get erections and that type mm -hmm. of thing. And now today there are so many drugs Which out works, yeah. uh, that can help people. But the, the people that have the most problem are the lower paraplegics, the T12, mm -hmm. L1, that get hurt in that area. Right. Um, they seem to have the most problem with that type of stuff. So I think the higher your injury, per se, the better off you are mm -hmm. as far as uh, sexual functioning mm -hmm. on the man's part. I don't know that much about the woman's uh, part of it. It's, mm -hmm. Okay. And what about um, working um, after your spinal cord injury? Maybe we should back up a little bit at this point and talk about motivation and how you became remotivated to um, kind of redirect your life uh, in a way that would work for you in a wheelchair. And, mm -hmm. and then with that, um, what kinds of jobs you kind of thought you'd be interested in and uh, how you make your living and that kind of thing. Okay. Well, as far as uh, motivation goes, my expression is keep your mind full and your bowels empty. And I tell that to most yeah. of my patients that I still work with. Uh, and keeping your mind full is so important. When I first got hurt, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was a mm -hmm. college student. Yeah. I did go back to college immediately, but um, I was taking up other things like photography and got into wheelchair basketball, got into wheelchair racing, where I met you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, just a number of things, anything to keep, keep yourself active and with something to do, a reason to get up. The hardest thing is probably just getting out of bed in the morning. You have to have a reason to get out of bed. And work, I think work is extremely important. You have to have a function in life, something right. that you're contributing to the fabric of society. You have to do something with yourself. Um, for me, it became teaching other people with spinal cord injuries. It became, I was very involved with the independent living movement. We had the third IL center in the country and worked on getting PCA care for people who needed it, worked on transportation. So I was very involved in all of that type of stuff, which kept my mind sharp. And mm -hmm didn't give me time to become depressed or wallow around and say, oh, poor me. It sounds like you really embraced what happened to you and said, okay, this is where I'm at in life, and so I'm going to move on from here and do what I can do. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. No. Uh, I had given myself yeah. seven years to walk again, mm -hmm. and I had really tried hard. I mean, I worked out day and night when I was in the hospital. And that was part of my reason for not sleeping. I was like, well, I'll die trying. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that was kind of, so I really did an awful lot of working out and exercising, getting my arms working. And um, so part of that is like a self-punishment thing. Mm -hmm. When I was wheeling up hills, I would just yeah. keep wheeling when I'd be tired. Like, oh. I said, no, 10 more feet, you rat, you know. And so I kept pushing myself that way, even though it was painful, but it just was like a, a self-punishment thing. But after seven years, when um, I had walked on braces and, mm -hmm. and things, which was for a C6 quadriplegic was, was pretty good, yeah. but it just, it's not walking, you're just hopping and swinging through, and right. okay, just to swing through gates, so what? Um, it was much too dangerous, too. I mean, just doing that was non-functional. I couldn't do anything else right. but, but swing walk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as far as putting on a shirt or trying to do something, forget it. Yeah. You know, my whole task was, was involved in that. So the wheelchair was much more efficient for me sure. than uh, anything trying with walking. But um, I went back to work as soon as I could just to get a little money and um, so that worked out well. It, I worked in the independent living movement for quite a while and uh, eventually was the executive director of a place. Then I broke my hip um, in an accident and so after that I quit working full time and mm -hmm. became a hearing officer for the state. So working part time I love much much better than yeah. uh, working full time and sure. uh, the teaching end of it I love. Mm -hmm. I love teaching and lecturing at the colleges and so that's, I think I've kind of found my niche in life and things are going okay. Great. Do you have any parting advice for spinal cord injured individuals or therapists who might be watching this video? Well, I think the uh, the ADL skills that you're about to see are, are only a good starting point. They're not written in stone, and you can certainly change them or take a piece of one, take part of another. And mm -hmm. So I would say feel free to use what you can and then adapt what doesn't work and change it. I think the biggest thing for therapists to realize is that you are working with other human beings and to um, you know, it should be a relationship where both of you are learning something new. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way I do things is not necessarily the way that some other quadriplegic or paraplegic would do it, and uh, it's just a starting point. So take the tips. If you can use them, great. Uh, might save you some time and trouble. At least it gives you some ideas of what to start with instead of mm -hmm. just, oh, what am I going to do with this patient? You can try a few things. Right. So I would say, as far as parting advice, um, try it, see what happens, mm -hmm. and okay. be flexible. Okay. Right. Well, on that note, let's take a look at some of the um, different ADL activities that you've mastered and uh, show those to those watching the video. Okay. Every morning when you get up, and the first thing that I do is stretch. And long leg stretching is very important uh, as far as maintaining your flexibility, but also in reducing your spasticity. Uh, so what I basically do is wake up, and a lot of times I'll just put my pillow right over here in the front and lay down on my legs and just stretch. And there's no bouncing. You don't want to be bouncing to get your uh, tendons to stretch out, so just take your time. I'm usually half asleep anyways and kind of just mulling over what I have to do for the day, just laying here. Uh, but eventually you'll get very flexible and this will help you with your transfers. And myself, I'm extremely flexible. I can go right down the full distance without any, any problems. So my advice would be to stretch first as far as your ADL routine goes. I would basically stretch, take a hot shower. Uh, that will also help reduce spasticity and loosen you up. Then get dressed, eat breakfast, do bowel care. Um, and if you have to cath in between there, um, I would do that, get ready to go to work, and you're off and running. This whole routine, the ADL routine, varies from 
person to person, but for myself it's about two hours, probably a little bit less, uh, depending on how everything goes. And, uh, so you have to plan around that. Uh, if you have to be to work for eight, you have to get up at least at 5.30 or so to make it there for eight. <laughs> As far as getting dressed in the morning, I uh, basically take whatever clothes I'm wearing for the day and throw them on the bed and put them on. Uh, we'll start with the leg bag. If you have to wear a leg bag, it's fairly easy as far as getting the straps on. Uh, there are several different types of tr straps to choose from. These just happen to be the rubber ones that come with it. Uh, and you can see you can just pull on them by doing this. Uh, it may take a little while to get used to this technique, but stretching it out is, is not that hard to do. And I just put the drainage valve up underneath the strap. And generally, tuck the straps in so they won't be hanging out. Try to be a little bit discreet about that. And as far as pants go, uh, there are all kinds of pants. You can wear any kind of pants you really want to. Uh, this type of pants happen to be made by a company called Gramici and Eastern Mountain Sports, IRS, all sell similar pants with a sewn-in belt that uh, you can tighten up with just one pull. As far as putting the pants on, I stick my hands inside of them and I'm using my wrist to hold them open and basically just throw them over your feet. Get each foot going down inside the right leg that it belongs in. And then I basically pick my leg up off the, and pull the pants underneath a little bit to get them started. And the same for the left. Once that's done, basically just pull the pants up by hooking your wrist in them and pulling them up. It's a fairly simple thing. You need to get your feet through each leg. And then, as far as pulling them over your clothing or over your hips, which is really the tougher part, I basically just the same wrist technique and turn to the side and pull it up. And then you can just grab the side of your bed and do the same way. You can use your wheelchair, which I, I generally just use my wheelchair because it's here. Uh, pull yourself up, and that's it. Now, as far as doing the belt, that's just a simple matter of I just lock it between my two fingers and push against it with this hand to give it some traction and pull them up. And that's basically all there is to that. Uh, as far as shoes and socks go, socks are a, a little more complicated. They took me a while to learn how to do. But basically, and these are fairly stretchy socks that I have, I'll stick my thumbs inside of them now instead of your wrist and use your thumbs to hook them outwards. And if you're having problems holding on to them, you can just put a little dab of saliva. You know? Don't be too squeamish. That'll help the sock to stick to your thumbs much better. And then to gain a purchase on it, you're pushing with your, I don't know, your lats or your triceps, not your triceps, but your, uh, your biceps and pectoral muscles, there's the word, pushing that against to hold it so that you're getting, otherwise it won't just come up and the same thing, you can pull it right up. Um, as far as putting a shoe on, once a, these are loafers. I also brought, um, you can wear sneakers. I wear sneakers with the simple Velcro over them. Or if I'm going swimming, I use a dive boot with a zipper on the side. And you want to do make sure to protect your feet. Don't go around without putting protection on your toes. One cut on your toe can 
lead to a long time in curing it because your circulation is not very good in your lower extremities. But basically, I just put it on snug, and then you can just push it up from the heel and wiggle it back and forth until it goes on. And that's pretty much as, as far as it goes, as far as getting your, your shoes on and off. It's a fairly simple routine. Another way of putting on a sock, it's uh, very similar, but a little trick, is to just put it over your foot. And if you're having trouble pulling it on, what I can do is just put a little saliva on both of your hands, and that gives you a good, and you can run the sock up over your foot just by pulling it on, and then sticking your thumb underneath it and sliding it all the way up. Uh, and I just do that. Uh, and the shoes, that's uh, pretty much the same way. There we go. As far as uh, sneakers go or that type of thing, I don't know that we need any Converse flyers or anything that will make you jump higher. Um, I just use a simple shoe with a Velcro top on it, and you can just pull it over. And they work great for knocking around. It gives your toes some protection. As far as going swimming or diving, anything like that, I use a dive boot. It's quarter-inch rubber with a sole on the bottom, and it's got a zipper on the side, and I just put a little loop on it and shimmy it on and put it up. But this will give you a lot of protection while you're swimming because if you're dragging your feet while you're swimming, you're asking for trouble. And uh, so always keep your feet protected as it's a hard area to heal if you do get injuries there. As far as putting shirts on, I usually use pullover shirts. Uh, the shirt I've been wearing today, you can just slip your arms through the sleeves, left and right, and then taking your thumb and pulling the neck open, and slide it down with your hands. Um, taking it off is a very simple matter of just taking your thumb and hooking it inside the shirt and pulling it over and off. So that if you're going to go to work or get dressed up, then I just put my arms through first and then hook my thumb in the back of it. And basically pull it over your head work it down. Now, the tricky part comes with doing the buttons and putting on a tie. For doing buttons, I use a button hook, which is one of the few uh, adaptive pieces of equipment that I use. To use it, it's fairly simple. And for ties, I'm just started going with these clip-on ties. They have some fairly good quality ones that you can buy nowadays. You just stick that inside and then clip it. Fairly ready for work, pretty much. Getting undressed goes uh, with the shoes and the socks. This is a fairly simple matter. With the shoes, I generally just undress while I'm in the chair and just push the loafers off. And then getting the socks off, very just a simple matter of sticking your fingers underneath and sliding them off. Um, and I take off both shoes first. Okay. As far as taking the pants off, I just stick your hand inside the pants to pull them open and then release the 
release these self-tightening belts while you're pulling them open. Give yourself some room. Okay. And then it's only a simple matter of getting them over your hips. chair to jump up with. Pull them over. Fortunately, I'm very flexible, so that makes it getting the pants on and off very easy. Uh, if you're not this flexible, maybe taking them off in bed is, uh, is the way to go. But uh, for a lot of people, just getting undressed in the chair is pretty much the norm. Brushing your teeth is relatively simple. I just use two hands where other people would probably just use one. piece of pine wood and you can make this up fairly easily and if you can't I'm sure they sell something similar on the market today but it's just a simple matter of placing your fingernail under the between the two cutters and clipping them off so it's a regular fairly easy task toenails are a little bit tougher and uh, you can just take this the other way around and put it on the floor and move it up to your toenail and clip them off. Or you can use a pair of scissors or something like that. Eating is one of the primary functions in life that you'll definitely want to learn how to eat without adaptation if possible. For myself, it was very embarrassing to have a, a cuff on and then be bending somebody's silverware to uh, eat with. Uh, we're going to do just a few simple things here. One banana, peeling a banana is regularly just hold it against your chest and between the two fingers and then pull up and you basically can peel your banana fairly easily that way. Uh, if you do have trouble, I mean, you can use your teeth to peel a banana. So, I mean, I'm not too delicate about it. If you want to be a fashion show, then that's one thing. But Sandwiches are always good. Uh, and picking them up, I just use one finger to kind of get it underneath there. 
When it comes to using a fork, we just happen to have a plastic one today, but you can pick them up several ways. One is to put your hand on it over here and then slide it between your fingers if you need to. Or you can drag it to the edge of the table and pick it up between your fingers. I mean, there are a number of ways. Whatever works, works. But the basic idea between a fork is you want the front end of it to be heavier than the back end, and it will balance in your hand just by its own friction against your upper finger and your lower finger. To pick up things, you can stick it in easily enough. Or you can, um, if you have to jab it in, you can use your other hand to jab it in. And that works equally as well. But the main thing is when you want to balance this thing, you do not have to hold on to it, as you can see. It's just a balancing act. One little trick that you may want to consider if you're a quadriplegic is carrying a knife with you. What I do is keep one knife clipped on the bottom of my chair. There's a little clip that allows it to clip on the bottom of the chair. And this is called an easy out knife. It's made by Gerber, if you need it. Or there are several of them. Spyderco makes one, and Buck makes one. But to pull the blade out, which is usually the hardest thing with any jackknife, this is just a matter of pinching it between your finger and thumb against your chest, pulling in with your biceps, and then opening it up. If that's too much, uh, you can actually open the same knife with your mouth if you need to, just with your lips. It's that easy. So and if you had to, you could just put it in your mouth and open it with your lips. Uh, fairly easy to, but very convenient to have around. There's all kinds of plastic wrappers and things that you need to get through during the day. Another little trick, if you want, is instead of clipping it underneath your chair, you can simply put it in a pocket if you have one on a Rojo cushion or just sew yourself one on there. Out of sight and very handy to get to it. As far as using a knife, um, again, a very simple matter. Picking it up, you can slide it to the edge of the table. You can use two hands or one. But basically, I would say put it between two fingers because this will give you more down pressure as far as pushing on it. And if you need more pressure than that, you can use your other hand and simply push down with it. If you're cutting something like steak, you may need to use two hands, one to hold the object so you can just pin it with your other hand and then draw the knife across it to cut. get the idea. I mean, as far as opening cans of soda, or even holding on to them for that matter, let's talk about holding on first. Uh, the simple matter of tenodesis works good with a fairly wet can as this one is. If you're having some trouble with that and holding on with slipping out, you can put one finger underneath it. This really gives you uh, a good grasp on it. Also, when you're picking things up, don't try to pick them straight up. Turn them on their side so that they're just like the fork. They're twisting in your hand, and that rotational moment helps it to gain a lot of traction and friction on your fingers. So this is much better than this, which can slip right out. Uh, opening a pop top is fairly simple. What I do is put one fingernail underneath it, and you're basically stretching your finger out to do that. So I just put it underneath there, push up, and you're done. When I got hurt, my friends put a six-pack of beer in front of me inside the bag and told me anything I could get out, I could have to drink, and that's when I learned to do pop tops. As far as doing uh, screw-on caps, uh, what I do is use the same tenodesis methods for holding on to it, but then pull it against your chest. And the way I taught myself to do this was to pinch it against your chest with your biceps again, and then you're rotating your elbow out. And that 
unscrews the thing. So you're basically unscrewing it that way. Sometimes, if something is really stuck on, you can use two hands and use your biceps to really press on it and then turn it. So you can unscrew it that way too, or screw it on if you really, really want to put it on there. Yeah. Now it's on. Drinking hot objects out of a cup is a little bit delicate. You do not want to grab a cup like this, especially if you don't have a lot of sensory feeling in your sensory perception in your hands. Uh, so what I generally do is any cup, you can hook your fingers in it, and the cup is held upright and away from you. So the hot part is not against your skin. So you're not burning yourself, and then you take a drink. It does go against your lower hand, but you're only here for a second or two before you put it back. So there are any number of cups you can find one that's comfortable for you, but generally you're out visiting somebody and somebody just hands you a cup of coffee or a glass, and you do want to be able to use anything that comes along. So it's a good practice with many different cups. Dealing with pens, again, you can slip it to the edge of the, and pick it up, which is very easy. It just becomes a natural motion. Pulling the cap off is a matter of pushing it against your chest again with both hands, and then pulling it out. I generally stick the cap back on the end to keep it longer. And I don't think my penmanship is any worse than it was before I got hurt. It was terrible then. It's still terrible now. <laughs> uh, and you can either use one hand to write, or if you, if you need more pressure, you can put two hands on it and then go a little bit darker, um, and anyway, that works. If I'm using a pencil or a ballpoint pen, I don't have the, any hand grafts to hold on to it, so if I put pressure on it, it slides out. So when I use a pencil or, or a ballpoint pen, I generally just use two hands to do this to write, and it works fine. When it comes time for picking up small, flat objects, such as coins, Again, it's awful hard to get enough tenodesis to pick this flat coin up. What I generally do is bring it to the edge of the table, and then you've got it. Uh, larger coins, no problems. If that's not a possibility, you can always use two fingers to flip it up and get underneath it. But. Uh, it looks much more natural if you can just drag it to the edge of the table and pick it up. Let's say you drop your coin. Uh, it's very easy to pick it up off a of carpeting. When you put pressure on it, on the outside of it, it automatically lifts it up. And you've got it, OK? On a harder surface, it's a little more difficult. One other little trick when picking up small objects, you may not be able to get a good purchase on them like that. I mean, if it's really tiny, these you can do it. With my right hand, I, my right hand is looser than my left hand. I have less tightness in it, and picking them up is a bit close to impossible. Uh, I can do it between two fingers, like this, if I need to. But one good little trick, you just put a little dab of spittle on your finger, and you can stick it right to your finger. So there's no need to monkey around. And this is, it's on there. So you may not want to pass out pills that way, but when you're taking them yourself, it works OK. Picking up heavier objects, like a, this oak 4 by 3 Tina Deesis is pretty much out of the question. The only real way to pick it up is to balance it. And if you just turn it on its side, then you can hold it fairly well by doing that. If it has notches in it, you can stick a finger under that notch and it will work fairly well. Or you can go back to the old method of putting one finger underneath it. 
So there are a number of ways to handle heavy objects. But in, by and large, balancing it is the really only good way to really handle with it. Uh, eventually, you're going to drop things on the floor. One of the tougher things to pick up is a book. So picking up a book is relatively easy if you get it right. I put my arm on the back of the chair, and then I generally just slide the book up and stand it upright. And again, you can put a little slide between your middle finger or so, stick it between the pages, and then you're using this to balance the book. And it's really stuck in there fairly good. If you can see how that is working. I won't go into the full mechanics of it, but try it. It's simple. When you pick up something like a phone book, you'll be glad you learned how to do that one. In this next section, we're going to cover transfers. And we're going to start with the sliding board, which would be the natural progression of things. We go from sliding board to no sliding board, and hopefully from there to uh, floor to chair or chair to floor. With the sliding board, most people basically get it under their leg and move forward in the chair. And I can tell you it wasn't this easy when I first started. I used to spray a little pledge on the board to make it nice and slippery so I could slip right across on one move. But most people arch their backs and raise their head and get into this position before sliding over. And that's great. That's really the way it's meant to work. So that's a standard uh, sliding board maneuver. Get up, arch your body, and then slide in. But transferring without the sliding board, you need to get your head way down. So you're using, my left arm here is one point of fulcrum, and my right arm is the other. And my legs are actually the third part. What I'm going to do is just put my head way down, and then lift. And that's kind of the slow motion end of it. If you were to jump out on the normal, you would just really kind of throw yourself forward and jump in. So that's how you transfer without the sliding board. But getting people to put their head way down is the hard part. And it may not be uh, comfortable for them to do that, but that's really the secret of good transfers. One transfer that you eventually will want to learn is the floor to chair transfer. And if you can do it unassisted, so much the better. One safety tip for your skin's sake is I would suggest that you put your cushion on the floor before you jump out of the chair, which is a good way to ensure the safety of your skin. So I generally would put this as a protection on the ground before you jump out. I have removable footboards on this chair, which are a big asset when it comes to getting close to the chair and getting back in. But I generally take them both off. And the things to be careful of when you transfer out of your chair are things that might abrade your skin, such as the brake, the top of the chair here, or either of these two pieces. After removing the cushion, I generally jump forward and turn sideways in the chair. And then using my left arm to lower myself down. And then the next thing is to put your hand somewhat to the back. You cannot jump out with your hand up front here. Otherwise, you'll fall over backwards and have no control. Having your hand behind you will allow you to come down gradually so that you can not damage your skin as you're jumping out of the chair. Basically, once you get your, trying to get your weight as far forward of your knees as possible. There you have it. You 
back in again. Again, put a towel over your tire just for your own safety sake for your skin. Showering is pretty simple. Um, you can have a handheld wand like this, or you can have a fixed head. It's not a big deal as long as you get wet and scrub around and clean everything up pretty well. One trick that I do is that I, when I'm in here, I pull my legs back quite right away so that I can stretch my heel cords while I'm taking a shower. So I generally pull my legs back quite a ways to stretch the heel cords out. By doing this while you take a shower, if it takes you 10, 15 minutes to stretch, do a shower, you're getting your heel cords stretched out good for 10 or 15 minutes. And believe me, in the morning, my legs are not this placid. Uh, after you finish your shower, drying off is, is a very simple thing. You can pretty much do that without a problem. One thing that I generally do is just put my towel on the side of the tub for drying the bottom of my feet and then put my feet on top of it and that dries the bottom of your feet before you can get out and you can dry your feet off. And then I put both feet out eventually before transferring back into my chair. Doing cat transfers is Something you'll learn to do five or six times a day at least. My truck being a four-wheel drive is a little higher than the normal truck. With cars, I generally use a two-door car and throw my chair in the back seat. But on this truck, I throw my chair in the front seat. And again, I jump to the front of the chair bend one leg, and just push down, and that makes your rear end up in the air. Put my legs in. Throw the cushion in the back. Hold up the chair. Move my legs out of the way. and I'm ready to roll. So you have basically gas and brakes. Steering allows you to turn the vehicle very easily and brake at the same time, or whatever combination you want. Blinkers are here. Very, very simple, no adaptation needed. That's about a $500 retrofit to uh, get this installed in your vehicle. This section we're going to cover some of the minor travel tips that may be helpful to your patients in the future. Uh, the first time you travel, you'll probably travel with three suitcases and your mother and after a while you decide that you need to kind of eliminate some of the stuff. I've seen people bring everything from wheeling commode chairs, shower chairs, to who knows what else. One of the best travel tips that I have is to carry everything with you that you're really going to need. I'm going to travel with my scuba club to go to different third world countries. A little backpack that I carry on the back of my wheelchair. And this has in it pretty much anything essential that I will need. 
the most essential thing that you probably won't be able to get in a third world country is a raised toilet seat. So in here, I carry a raised toilet seat. And along with that, you might want to take any, uh, this fits right in there. raised toilet seat and they have little screw-on feet that basically just screw into here and you can clamp this onto almost any toilet in the world and if you need to bend these pieces they're not so firm that you can't bend them you can bend them in and out of shape to make it fit whenever it's possible uh, so when you travel you'd also take any uh, medications that you really need because you're certainly not gonna be able to get a prescription in some foreign country. Uh, take your money, travel checks. Anything essential should come with you as carry-on luggage onto the plane. You never leave it. And that's rule number one. And your chair always goes with you. Now, in a lot of places when you travel, if you can't get into the bathroom, which is another big problem, there are a number of little tricks. If you have a folding chair, You can simply bring along a regular belt. And with this belt, you can take and make it any size you want and get off your chair on the bed, fold your chair up, put this belt around it, and then unfold it. And this belt will hold your chair at a certain narrower width. Then put your cushion back on, jump back on the narrow chair, and you might be able to make it through the bathroom doors. When I was racing around the world, a lot of places had very small bathrooms, and some of us had non-folding chairs. And to get around that problem, I simply made up a set of wheels, they're just casters, and these mounted into the back of the chair where your wheelie wheels would fit in. So you'd simply take this nut out, or bolt out, and stick this in place, and then put this back through where your wheelie wheels would clip into your chair. And with two of these, you can get into any, any bathroom stall just about anywhere. My chair becomes 16 inches wide with these two things. Very good for working with, uh, if you're traveling sailing on boats, most of their bathrooms are very small. And this will allow you to pull yourself along the furniture and to get into the bathroom with a very narrow door. One travel tip that's very handy for camping and various emergencies wherever you're out uh, in the woods, that type of thing, or canoeing especially, or kayaking. You can't really carry a whole lot. But if you can grab a milk crate and put a plastic bag in it, then if you have your raised toilet seat, that will fit right on top of it. And not the greatest for balance because there's no back on it, but it's a fairly stable platform and it gives you emergency commode with access to your bottom. And so you can set this up in almost any tent and you have yourself your portable bathroom. Okay. Well, Charlie, you've certainly given us a lot of valuable information over the last hour or so in the videotape. And I think it's going to be wonderful for students and spinal cord injured individuals alike to be able to look at that information and take what they can from it. One of the things that we didn't um, get a chance to cover was recreational activities and music. What do you, kinds of things do you do for recreation and what kinds of music do you enjoy? And can you give us some insights into those activities in your life? Okay, well, as far as recreation goes, I sky's the limit. I've flown planes, gone dog fighting, gone hang gliding. Uh, this year I hope to try ultralight airplanes out sometime. Um, scuba diving, kayaking, canoeing, fishing, everything is wide open and I think if if you want to do something it's out there to be done. And so you're able to figure out a way to adapt the activity that you want to do to your um, physical situation in order to participate in it? Exactly, and I've, I've been most fortunate. I have 
uh, a cousin who's the same age as me. We grew up together, and he is a, a great asset. He's helped me modify. I have a tractor. Mm -hmm. He's helped me modify. I have a 25-foot trailer, camping trailer that I towed behind my truck, uh, which he helped me. He built the lift literally yeah. for that. Uh, and anything, playing pool, he's made things. We just do, we just look at it as a challenge. Bicycling, we've made all kinds of things. I have another friend now in biking who um, helped me make a, a hand cycle, an off-road hand cycle that's fully suspended. It's just incredible, wow. just really. And so I've been very blessed in having people around that will help me do these things. So it sounds like you have a really full life, not only with work, but also with recreation. Yeah, I try, to, I try to play more than I work, uh -huh. <laughs> which is my motto. I figure if yeah. I'm in a wheelchair, life owes me something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to, try to play more than I work now. And uh, as far as music goes, mm -hmm. I've been pretty much boiled down to the harmonica. I used mm -hmm. to know how to play the piano and the trumpet oh. and things like that, but uh, the harmonica is pretty much the bottom line for that. And how did you get interested in the harmonica? Was it just an easy piece to uh, hold? or? It, well, at first it wasn't that way, but mm -hmm. a friend of mine, when I first got hurt, I had trouble breathing and out in Montana, and she just brought me in a harmonica and said, well, here, maybe you can learn to play this while you're breathing. Quite and uh, so from there, I used to play what is it, from this valley, they say you go, Red River oh, yeah. Valley. And uh, from there, one thing led to another, and now I can play it fairly well, or I can play it, let's put it that way. I'm not an accomplished musician. Mm -hmm. I don't play much, maybe once or twice a year, I'll pick it up. Around the campfire. That's about it. <laughs> How would you feel about giving us a little serenade on your harmonica before well, we close? I can do that. I won't okay. promise you anything, but I can do that. <laughs> I just happen to have one here. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Getting it out of the case is probably the toughest thing. You should probably say yeah. that, but... Yeah, that's okay. He's still fine. Uh, I'll just play something like Camp Town Races, I think. Okay. Something simple and quick. <laughs> <laughs> 